Hey guys, welcome to Through the Bible Verse by Verse, a plain and simple study through the entire Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. We are currently in Genesis chapter 2, and let me remind you uh, that, as I said, we're doing a slow crawl through the first 11 chapters of Genesis because uh, there's so much to unpack. And since we don't get a chance to teach on this and talk about this often, there's so much to talk about here in these first 11 chapters. Um, the book of Genesis all together, but um, I think by taking the time to go through um, slowly, it certainly will help us understand a lot of things where the Bible is concerned, life, God's plan and purpose. And uh, one other thing, um, you're looking at a still picture of me. And, I, and, and let me just say this. I, I think I told you this a few studies ago. I was in a pretty bad accident, kind of got banged up pretty good. So I'm still in the healing uh, phase. So I'm just going to uh, keep this kind of still photo for a few more until... Uh, you know some of the scars heal on my face so uh but so that's why you see a, a steel photo here all right so we're in chapter two and i, and I want to read because we're going to move on um god has created the garden of eden and we talked about um and, and let me just say this during this time there is um, probably one land mass, and um, so the garden of the the garden of Eden seemed to have been in the center of the earth. Um, I gave you one math map to kind of give you an ideal, maybe just a, an ideal of where the um, garden of Eden could have been. But anyway. I'm going to just quickly let me do this, but as you can see, this is a Bible map here, but in today's Middle East, you can kind of see where the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the Black Sea, different other seas like that. What's important <coughs> excuse me, to, to see here is the Euphrates River and the Tigris River. Those two rivers that still exist today. And as you remember, uh, Moses said that the garden, the, 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 a river ran out of the garden that formed into those four rivers. So depending on where those rivers came together, again, just a little, of course, a lot of things changed after the fall of man. So you can't be for sure that is that. But that's where, where we're at now, that God is putting man into the garden. And a very interesting statement he's going to make here. Remember we talked about sin and death. God introduces sin and death. And says, you know, don't eat of the tree of good and evil. Because in the day that you eat of it, you will die. So don't sin, because if you sin, you will die. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go on. I'm going to start reading in verse 15 again. And, um, and then just to, for continuity. So verse 15. It says, The Lord God took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And we said the term work. Notice right from the beginning it was meant for man to work. And then again, that, that's kind of interesting because even though Adam had it great, notice he still had a job. Now, it wouldn't have been working the sweat and the toil that we work under, but he nevertheless had to work. And if I were to say something, uh, I think in heaven we're going to have things to do. We're not going to just be floating around on clouds playing harps, okay? In other words, I, this kind of shows us what God's character is here. So man was to work and watch over it. Verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free 
to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for on the day that you eat from it, you will certainly die. Um, so we talked about that. I'm not going to go f further into that. He tells man this. And notice he commands man this. Verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper as his complement. What is amazing about this verse here, of course, is right away we see it was God himself who created man to have a mate, a wife. In other words, it was never God's intent or intentions for man to be alone. In other words, and, and even when we just examine, in other words, think about this. And again, we're talking before the fall. So let's say idealically, just, just thinking about this, had man not sinned and then had children, um, everyone conceivably would have been married because everyone would have been following God's plan. Now, now, why do I say that? Let's first ask this question. Why did God say it is not good for the man to be alone? Now, again, it's hard for us to answer that because, remember, we are looking at this after sin, after the fall. So, so if we look at this before the fall, I think it's important that we should understand, again, God's plan, what, what he intended. So why did God say right off the bat here, it is not good for the man to be alone? And uh, a simple answer to that is because this is how he created the man. This is what he created. So when he formed man's body, now you also got to remember man is spirit, has a soul, and living a body. And so all three parts are designed by God to not be alone. Right? In other words, think about this. Our emotions, our desires are designed to have a mate. I can't really speak in terms of how our spirits would <laughs> relate to that. But certainly our bodies. Well, I, I'll put it this way. Uh, I'll say our spirits in, in line with being in unity and unison with God, flowing with God, which would certainly make the relationship better, secure, and ultimately the ultimate purpose of God in terms of happiness. Okay? Because we live out of our spirits. Um... But then, of course, our bodies are made to crave. See, they're made to crave human companionship. Our bodies are. See, God made that. So one of the most um, God-given natural relationships is the human marriage man and woman now um I, i'm going to say this and i'm and, and then i'm just going to only say this uh as far as what god created in terms of marriage because in our culture today we are dealing with, uh, I'm going to say, some strange issues 
right? When you think about the LGBTQ and then all the other letters as they're continually making the letters up and what, you know, people are deciding for themselves to say, well, okay, I was born, you know, a male or female, but now I'm not a male and female. Or just on the same you know, uh, gay relationships, and people will say, um, you know, uh, what is wrong with having a gay relationship, a gay marriage? I, I'm not going to get into that because here's my, my, my answer to them is you need Jesus, first and foremost. In other words, and there's no sense in me arguing with a person who doesn't know Christ and then are seeking to live a life apart from Christ, their first thing is they need Christ. But believe it or not, there, there, there may be some Christians who are asking the question, can a, uh, is it possible to have a gay relationship? In fact, there was a very popular gospel artists and this this person was as as, pos, as as popular as popular can get who came out in support of the LGBTQ community okay so and then there are believe it or not those of you may or may not know there are those who call themselves gay Christians so here's my point to them <laughs> That if you want to start with God, and then we can say, all right, what did God create? All right, what did God create? And what we're going to see, when I'm getting into today, but what we're going to see, he created a man, and then he created a female as a companion. All right, so, um, um, so anything other than that gets into the perversion of sin. In other words, and, 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 and again, we're going to really, really, really talk about sin in the third chapter. So right now we're talking about what did God create? In other words, we can know what is right and wrong because we're going to start off of this is what God created. The very first thing he says is that it is not good for man to be alone. So right there, as Adam is standing there, a fully functional man God says it's not good for him to be alone so we can only imagine right we can only imagine what Adam might have thought right what what did what did Adam what did Adam think now, I do have a question, and I'm only going to ask it as a question. Okay, just just a question. But I do have to wonder, just in Adam's normal life, would he have slept? Think about that. In Adam's normal life, would he have slept? Okay. And the reason why I say that is because I, I, I was just thinking about the um, the tree of life. See, remember, we sleep now because it uh, the sleeping rehabs our body, right? Heals and different things like that. If you don't sleep, your body doesn't heal from that. But um, and Adam had, but to Adam, would Adam have needed to do that? Especially with the tree of real life. Again, I just wanted to put that that out there, that 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 question out there. Okay. All right. But Adam, as he's standing there with God, fully man. So obviously, emotionally, physically, he's yearning. He's sensing something that everything else in life is not giving him 
Okay? Everything else in life is not giving him. Um, in other words, he feels something, right? And who knows if he's even aware of, I need the touch of a woman. Right? So that would be the physical part. And yes, God created him to yearn for that trust. To not, I'm not going to call it lust, although lust wouldn't have been wrong at that time. But his body was made to, to, to crave a woman's touch. His body was made to have sexual intercourse. And then to achieve... The ultimate climax orgasm with a woman. That's what, okay? So at this point, he doesn't have that. God is saying, guess what? It is not good for man to be alone. Why? Right? Because if he is alone, then think about this question. If he's alone, what will he do? And think about this. If he's alone, anything that he may try to do in order to have for, <coughs> excuse me fulfillment anything he may try to do in order to have fulfillment God says that's not good because he's, he's, he's not going to achieve that fulfillment that's why it's not good for him to be alone and of course, what is interesting here is that the only way that God is saying that the man is going to be good is not going to be anything else, right? Watch this. He's getting ready to create the woman. But watch this. Anything else, right? Anything else, he said, it's not good. Think about that. So you think about all of the sexual perversion, right? Think about the soulish realm, his minds, what he could desire, what his emotions are. God said, that not good for man to long. So man cannot go and make it with a tree, right? Man cannot, think about this, everything else that man does other than what God is getting ready to do God says it's not good God made him as far as his sexual appetites as far as his physical emotional appetite for companionship that's what I'm talking about here everything else God has just declared it's not good Couldn't God have said, well, uh, you know, Adam can go sit on the tree and, you know, uh, you know, play with himself, masturbate. Could not God have done that? But notice, it is not good for the man to be alone. So therefore, anything the man does alone when it comes to relationships, God just said it is not good for the man to be alone. And it is also to know that we're talking about not just sexual, but mental, emotional, physical. It's not good for man to be alone. Obviously, you all, we're going to continue this in the next study. So I will pick it up with you next time in the next study. See you then.